All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Thursday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having an incredible week. Got another series preview for you today. The Philadelphia 76ers and the New York Knicks. Spoiler alert, I went into this uh, uh, film session this morning thinking I was going to pick one team, and then I ended up picking the other team after watching the film. I'm excited to dive into it from the perspective of both teams. After that, I've got a little bit of a a film session. We've got 20 clips we're going to go through, 19 clips, excuse me that we're going to go uh, through from this particular matchup. So for you guys listening on the podcast feed, if you want to see some film representations of the things that I'm talking about, you're going to want to head over there. There are some specific takes that I have about how the Sixers should defend the Knicks that I think seeing some footage will help you guys kind of get a better feel for. And then lastly, at the end of the day today, we're going to do a little bit of mailbag. I'm going to start by talking about Team USA and their 12-man roster that they're taking to the Olympics this summer. And then after that, I've got four mailbag questions that go around the rest of the league. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JasonLT so you guys don't miss any show announcements or film threads that I do from time to time. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. And then last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in those YouTube comments about once a week over the course of the rest of the postseason. I'll be hitting mailbags. Obviously, we're going to do them more over the other portions of the year, but I still plan on doing them. All right, let's talk some basketball. So the Knicks won the season series 3-1. to one. Embiid only played in one of the games, though. It was a game the Knicks won by 36 points back in January. A really hot shooting night from the New York Knicks in that one. The Knicks have a 112 offensive rating in this matchup, but the Sixers have a 93 offensive rating in this matchup. The Knicks have also dominated the glass, even in the game that Embiid has played. Uh, when Embiid's on the floor this year, they're generally a pretty good rebounding team. Uh, but they've been really bad without him on the floor, and they can struggle in some specific lineups, and that's obviously going to be a key a key kind of trend to keep an eye on in this series. On the gambling front, super close. Uh, DraftKings has this one at Sixers minus 115, so very slight favorite for the Sixers. Let's start with the New York Knicks on offense. So uh, my guess is they're going to start the series based on the starting lineup that they went with in the Heat game. My guess is they're going to start the series with Kelly Oubre on Jalen Brunson. We're going to talk about this in more detail in a minute, but that Brunson matchup gets a little tricky, and I also wouldn't be surprised if we see a different Philly starting lineup either to start the series or down the line. But based on Miami, they went with Kelly Oubre Jr., um, Tyrese Maxey, Kyle Lowry, Tobias Harris, and Joel Embiid. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a guy like Nick Batum slotted in for uh, for someone like Kyle Lowry. But we'll, we'll see what that ends up looking like as the series progresses. But if they do stick with their starting lineup that they used against Miami, I expect Kelly Oubre Jr. to get the Jalen Brunson assignment. And he has gotten it for entire games this year. Uh, I think we'll see Do- uh, Tyrese Maxey on Dante DiVincenzo. Don- Dante DiVincenzo, since the Julius Randle injury, is attempting like 12 threes a game and is flying around off of screens. And you're going to need some speed to deal with that. So I think they're going to go with Tyrese Maxey there. We have, I think we're going to get Kyle Lowry on Josh Hart. I think we'll get Tobias Harris on OG Ananobi. And then obviously Joel Embiid on Isaiah Hartenstein. So let's start with the Brunson matchup. So we know what the back end of the coverage is going to look like. It's going to be uh, Joel Embiid in a deep drop coverage. That goes without saying. He's going to try to kind of split that difference between getting up high enough to bother some of those floaters and short jump shots that Brunson takes while also protecting the rim. And then uh, we also know that in that action, Hartenstein is primarily looking to kind of roll towards the front of the rim so he can like make that little pop shot in the lane. And so those little short range shot making situations for Brunson and Hartenstein are going to be key and Embiid getting good contests there are going to be key as well. So on film, I actually didn't really like the Kelly Oubre reps. I thought that he used his length to kind of contain Brunson relatively well, but I didn't think he did enough in terms of ball pressure or actually attacking uh, from behind and back pressure situations to make Jalen Brunson uncomfortable. Now, that like in the lone Philadelphia win that they had this year, Oubre was on him for the most part, and Brunson went six for 22, but I thought it was more of a team-wide thing. Uh, I I didn't think Kelly Oubre had much impact on the shot results for Jalen Brunson there. Now, in the one game that Joel Embiid played, it was actually Nick Batum who guarded Jalen Brunson from the opening tip. And even though Brunson had a better game, and even though the Knicks won, 
I actually thought Nick Batum did a really nice job. Relentless pursuit through all their screening actions. He has the length to bother and pester Jalen Brunson from behind, which is going to be key because it's like a bracket. Every time we talk about pick and roll coverages, it's a bracket when you try to defend two on two. It's back pressure and it's rim protection. And like, again, when you've got him beat on the one end, the better your back pressure is, the more you can funnel him into him and kind of limit those opportunities. And so you guys will see when we get to the tape here uh, in a few minutes when we get to the film session. But I'm going to show you guys some examples. I think Nick Batum is up to this challenge, and I think he's the guy that should get that look. And so I wouldn't be surprised if in game one, they just put Batum in for Kyle Lowry and made that sort of move. But don't be surprised if it's something where like over the course of game one, Nick Batum has some good reps on Jalen Brunson, and then they make that sort of adjustment later on in the series. So my guess is they start with Oubre, but I I think the best version of the Sixers defense against New York is Batum on the ball. A good example, honestly, if you don't want to wait for the film, is just look at what the job he did on Tyler Harrow last night. I thought he did a really nice job chasing him over the top late, had a huge block on a Tyler Harrow pull-up jump shot late in the game. That's kind of like something that I think that he's especially gifted with, especially with pull-up shooters in ball screens. Obviously, supreme athletic speed is something that he's going to struggle with, but Jalen Brunson and Tyler Harrow are not guys that have supreme athletic speed, and I think that's something that he demonstrated last night. Um, I like the other thing too that it kind of mitigates this to a certain extent is I don't like the Sixers will do a good amount of switching from uh, a two through four, and the Knicks are pretty good about using little brush screens and guard guard screens to get different guys switched on to Jalen Brunson before they run the action. But this is another reason why I like Batum. He, he doesn't die on screens. He fights over the top. He uses that length. I think you can use that as a weapon in this series. Again, I mentioned Maxi on DiVincenzo mainly to lock and trail for speed. Uh, the other thing there too is the way that the Knicks attacked this over the course of the regular season is they just ran Jalen Brunson, Dante DiVincenzo two-man game. And so when they did, they would get Tyrese Maxey switched on to Jalen Brunson and then Jalen Brunson would just go to work. You guys will see a sequence where he scored on Tyrese Maxey and then the very next possession, they ran it again and they ended up having to double team. And fortunately, Jalen Brunson missed the read, but they left a wide open Dante DiVincenzo on that play. So like that's the 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 one of the downsides there is they're going to try to maybe try to counter the Joel Embiid issue or excuse me, the uh the uh, ball screen issue with, with dealing with Joel Embiid at the rim by just running guard guard actions and trying to target Tyrese Maxey in like ghost screens and screening for switches and things along those lines. Uh, the Sixers did counter that by switching and doubling, but we'll see if they can maybe uh, opt for something more like a hedge and recover. So instead of switching or or having to double, just have Tyrese kind of show high. He has the speed to to get a decent closeout on Dante. All he needs to do is just kind of throw a hedge that's enough to kind of flatten out Jalen Brunson's driving lane, and he might have an opportunity to get back. My guess is we'll get Kyle Lowry on Josh Hart. Again, the main thing there is just uh, you want Kyle Lowry roaming around in help situations, taking charges, digging in on drives. Josh Hart is a 0.85 points per possession spot-up player, so you can get away with late closeouts there. Now, if Batum comes in for Lowry, my guess is they'll slot Kelly Oubre down onto OG Ananobi, and then they'll move Tobias Harris onto Josh Hart, and then he'll be in that spot where he needs to kind of roam around and be helping other other main responsibility in that spot is just keeping Josh Hart off the offensive glass. Josh Hart is fifth in total offensive rebounds among guards this season. And obviously, he's a major part of New York's attack. They try to manufacture as many, as many points as possible on the margins through second chance points and attacking in transition and all that kind of stuff. And so those are going to be keys defensively for the Sixers. Tobias Harris on OG Ananobi, mainly just because it's going to be about dealing with bully ball. OG Ananobi, when he does look to attack, is typically looking to use his size and strength. And I think Tobias Harris is best equipped out of those forwards to handle that type of physical aggression. And again, that's why I'd put Kelly Oubre there if you do move Batum into the lineup, because Kelly can do a decent job as well. Uh, now, here's the thing. OG Ananobi will run a little bit of action. But for the most part, the primary concern with OG Ananobi is athlete plays. Running the lane in transition, attacking closeouts, cutting to the basket, attacking the offensive glass. 
the vast majority of shot attempts that OG and Ananobi gets are in those types of situations. So it's mainly about Tobias Harris just kind of winning some of those hustle battles to mitigate OG's uh, production. <clears throat> now, if uh, with Joel Embiid and Isaiah Hartenstein, the big thing for Joel there is going to be about watching out for the balance between helping on everything, but also making sure you keep an eye on Isaiah Hartenstein. So what Joel will do, and you'll see in the footage, he's just trolling everything around the paint. And he's kind of ignoring Isaiah Hartenstein when he has the ball in the middle of the floor. Even when he has the ball and he's looking for cutters or guys coming off screening actions, Embiid's just sitting back way at the basket. But Hartenstein has the ability to just put the ball on the floor and quickly attack. He loves to quickly attack to that left-hand side and get all the way to the rim. He can make little pop shots in the lane as well. So it's going to be about towing that line and just being careful for Joel Embiid in terms of helping off things at the paint, but also making sure that he's attentive to the random attacks that Isaiah Hartenstein can go on. Keys for both teams, again, for the Sixers defending Brunson, applying that back pressure and defending and drop. Just close the bracket, make him feel as uncomfortable as possible and limit his efficiency. And then controlling the defensive glass. The Knicks are the best offensive rebounding team in the league, second best second chance points team in the league. Now the Sixers statistically have been a bad rebounding team this year, but up until the Embiid injury, they were a top 10 defensive rebounding team. So I do think that they should be able to hold up better than they have in this matchup throughout the course of this series. But again, in the one game Embiid did play in the regular season, they struggled. That's a trend they're going to have to flip to have any chance. On the Knicks front, got to get Brunson better matchups whenever possible. So guard, guard screens, brush screens and transition, stuff like that, trying to get different defenders that have less length and quickness on him before he gets into his ball screens. And then who's going to provide secondary offense? For the most part, after the Julius Randle injury, it's been Dante DiVincenzo, mainly just through high-volume three-point shooting. But they don't really have a guy on the roster who can consistently run action and consistently generate higher-quality shots outside of Brunson. And, and that's an issue. And so like having one of those guys just kind of step up, I don't know if that's OG Ananobi. I don't know if that ends up being Dante DiVincenzo. Uh, Deuce McBride's a guy who has some off-the-dribble pop. Maybe that ends up being a, a direction they lean into more. But they're going to need somebody to kind of step up. And then they need to manufacture as many points as possible on the margin. So again, second chance points on the offensive glass, like we mentioned, forcing turnovers and getting out in transition. Sixers with the ball. My guess is we'll get Dante DiVincenzo on Tyrese Maxey. We might see some OG and an OB on Tyrese Maxey, but my guess is Dante DiVincenzo will start. Uh, uh, Jalen Brunson on Kyle Lowry or Batum. Obviously, if he ends up starting, uh, I think you tuck Jalen Brunson on uh, on him. Josh Hart will most likely be guarding Kelly Oubre Jr. And I think you put OG Ananobi on Tobias Harris. And the main reasoning there is like Tobias Harris is like the forward that is more likely to try to make a play with the ball in his hands. Like he's the guy that'll run a little bit of action, look to score in the post, look to just attack and semi-transition off the bounce. Like that's where I think OG Ananobi's ability to slide his feet and absorb contact and like kind of withstand some of Tobias Harris's bully ball. I think that's advantageous. And then obviously I think we're going to get Isaiah Hartenstein on Joel Embiid. So first question is the defending of Tyrese Maxey. Now here's the thing. In the film, Tyrese doesn't have much trouble getting to his spots. He's too fast for all the Knicks guards. That doesn't say much. He's too fast for basically every player in the league. The only guy that I think has done a good job kind of hanging with him from a quickness standpoint is Deuce McBride. And I, I, I just don't think he's going to play enough necessarily for it to matter. Maybe he does. We'll see. Maybe that ends up being a matchup they lean into more. But for the most part, it's an athletic mismatch there. But even though Tyrese has them on their heels a lot, Maxi has a weakness, and that's his pull-up jump shooting. He shoots 44% on catch-and-shoot jumpers, but he shoots only 34% on pull-up jump shots. That actually drops from 1.3 points per shot attempt to 0 0.9 points per shot attempt. So almost a 40% dip in efficiency, actually more than a 40% dip in efficiency when he takes a dribble before he takes the shot. So you'll see on ball screens, they're still chasing him over the top and trying to funnel him into traffic. But in like any sort of situation where Tyrese is kind of bearing down on a guy off the dribble, you'll see them get back on their heels and they're kind of just willing to give a late contest because Tyrese just hasn't been as good at making that shot as he has been any sort of catch and shoot type of shot. But again, that, that matchup's going to be key because he does a lot of shooting off the move uh, where he won't dribble. He'll just come off the corner, 
come off of like a wide pin down into a dribble handoff from Embiid, and he'll just rise and fire off the catch. And so you're going to have to lock in trail, have to stay attached. Uh, but that's definitely going to be a big advantage. Like he can beat people off the dribble. And you saw last night in that uh, Miami Heat game, like once Tyrese kind of figures out where his driving angles are, he just starts kind of breaking people down and you get into rotation. That's how you get Joel Embiid wide open at the top of the key. That's how you get Joel Embiid offensive rebound opportunities and open looks for Nick Batum and other guys is when you get compromised at the point of attack. And that's something that Tyrese Maxey can do. Now, again, in the starting configuration, like I said, I want OG and Anobi on Tobias Harris to contain any sort of off-the-dribble moves he makes. With Isaiah Hartenstein on Embiid, you'll see some examples in the film. When Embiid tries to make a move, he can power through Hartenstein, but Hartenstein can absorb the contact long enough to kind of slow down that advance. That's where it becomes about shrinking the floor. And you'll see examples in the film when the Knicks don't shrink the floor, where Embiid just kind of goes through Hartenstein and gets all the way there. But when they do shrink the floor, Hartenstein will absorb the blow. It'll slow Embiid down enough, and guys can come around and, and get late contests. And you'll see some blocks on Embiid on plays where Hartenstein absorbed that initial bit of contact. But like I, I think he's capable of it, but it's a team-wide job. And then we're going to talk about it later, but it's going to be about mixing up coverages. The other thing, too, is just in those face-up situations, shrinking the space without fouling. Embiid has a tendency to go cold, especially with that shot, especially in the postseason, but he can't let him get too comfortable there because that's kind of his bread and butter. And once he gets confident, he's going to knock him down. And so shrinking that space without uh, fouling is going to be important. Keys for both teams. On the Knicks front, mixing up coverages with Embiid. Leave him in single coverage sometimes. Help, late help from the baseline. Late help from the middle early double teams. Like I said, double teams after he puts the ball on the floor. Uh, I throw in some zone in there. I mean, you guys saw what happened with Miami last night, a little bit of zone, especially if if they can kind of, uh, if Tom Thibodeau can kind of replicate some of Spolstra's ball denial in there where it's like, it's a zone, but they're constantly denying Embiid wherever he's at on the floor. That's another way that they can try to mix things up. But like, keep Embiid off balance. Don't let him solve your defensive coverage. And then lastly, containing Tyrese Maxey's dribble penetration as much as possible. <clears throat> On the Sixers front, ironically, I think it's all about jump shooting. Teams are going to concede pull-up jump shots to Tyrese Maxey uh, uh, in like ISO situations. Joel Embiid, like we talked about earlier, is face-up jumper. That's such an important part of his offensive game at this point and has been basically the primary genesis of his playoff downfalls over the years. And then the role players. Again, like look at last, last night. It's like when guys are missing... They get, they get uh, hesitant, they get tentative, they lose their confidence. All of a sudden, Nick Batum starts making threes, and the, the lid just comes off the rim now. Buddy Heald's hitting threes, now Joel Embiid's hitting threes, and everything just kind of breaks open for them. And so, again, jump shooting is going to be key. Maxi off the dribble, uh, Embiid in face-up situations, role players in catch-and-shoot situations, they have to make shots. So, prediction. I've gone back and forth about this series a bunch of times. I came in thinking it was going to be the Knicks. Then I started to think it was going to be the Sixers. Then I was kind of on the fence, and I landed on the Philadelphia 76ers. Here are the key reasons. I'm really worried about New York's ability to score in the half court over the course of this series. I think they're going to constantly have a 6'8 athletic wing on Jalen Brunson, funneling him towards Embiid while helping from behind. I think there are enough guys on the floor that they can get late closeouts to that they're going to be able to kind of pack the paint on him a little bit. I, I I really think that when you kind of stack up shot creation in this series, as much as I respect Brunson, and you guys know I do, and obviously I believe that if you get him a secondary shot creator, that this Knicks team is a bona fide championship contender, like top-tier championship contender. That's how good I think this team can be. But it's just a lot to ask when you basically have your secondary offensive option is just Dante DiVincenzo takes a bunch of threes. I think in, I think that uh, over the course of this series, Nick Nurse is just going to have more and more options available to him to slow down their shot creation. Whereas like Embiid is going to get the defense in rotation. Tyrese Maxey, his dribble penetration, is going to get the defense in rotation. I just think they have more offensive talent than New York does. And I think that Philly's defensive scheme is going to be able to contain Jalen Brunson enough to slow them down. Honestly, I don't, because like the counterpoint there would be like, well, what about guys like, you know, uh, um, uh, we talked about um, uh, Deuce McBride earlier, obviously Boyan Bogdanovich, Alec Burks. Those are good players, but I just, I, I think if you move those into your core five, 
you can start to run uh, suffer from some other issues in terms of size and quickness and athleticism elsewhere on the floor. So I don't really think that solves the problem. Um, and so honestly, like I, I think from that standpoint, it just comes down to like half court shot creation. And I believe Philadelphia is going to do a little bit better there. I also think the Sixers have the best player in the series. Uh, like again, you can't, Joel Embiid played like crap last night, but because he's so incredibly gifted, he made like four or five massive plays down the stretch that the Heat just couldn't do anything about, and they won. That is a superpower that I don't even think Jalen Brunson can reach. And so I think that's a huge advantage. Now, here's the thing. I think the Knicks are a tougher team than Philly. I think, they, I think they're more resilient. I think they're more bought in. They have better basketball character. I think they can withstand runs better. And so because of that, I think it's going to be a very long series. And I think the Knicks will likely lead the series early. But I think late in the series, the advantages for Philly will take over. If I had to pick a set of games, I think that they'll split in New York. My guess is the Knicks will win game one and the Sixers will win game two. And then they'll split back in Philly. And then they'll go back to New York, and I think the Knicks will win game five, and I think they'll go up three games to two. Then I think the Sixers win in rather convincing fashion in game six, and I think they win an absolute rock fight in game seven in Madison Square Garden. So I'm picking the Philadelphia 76ers to beat the Knicks in seven games. Really tough one for me. This is, of, of all the series that I've had to pick, so far in this playoff run, I think this one has been the toughest one for me so far. The NBA season is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Right now, new customers bet 5 bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Right now, the championship favorite is the Boston Celtics at plus 190. You can also get the Lakers at plus 3,500. So if you're a believer in their late season run, that is a big number. Uh, North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. The crown is yours. All right, let's take a look at some film. Get over to our film setup here. This first action is an example of the way that Jalen Brunson uses screens to get different matchups before he goes into ball screens. So here again, we're going to get Nick Batum on Jalen Brunson. By the way, get ready to see a bunch of weird personnel. Uh, these teams dealt with injuries and trades all year long, and so it's just a bunch of different guys than you're expecting. But we're mainly looking at some, some specific and key matchups and actions. So look at this. You set a quick um, – you're going to set a quick screen here to get uh, Nick Batum off of Jalen Brunson. Now Tobias Harris is in the action. And as a result, Tobias Harris, not as good of a screen navigator. Brunson's able to work downhill. This is that dynamic of drop coverage defense with Embiid that I'm talking about. How many of these battles, these that little hesitation move gets him a little bit of an angle. He gets in and he sinks a floater here. How many of those battles is Jalen Brunson going to win? How many battles is Joel Embiid going to win. That's that drop coverage bracket dynamic that I'm talking about. That's a clip where Brunson won. Here's an example of Joel Embiid uh, getting to work, very next possession actually, getting to work on Isaiah Hartenstein in the middle of the floor. The Knicks do a poor job of shrinking the floor here. So watch, Hartenstein, Embiid's just able to go through him, but look at the Knicks. They just kind of leave this entire lane of the floor. Dante DiVincenzo gets a late dig, but he's not there soon enough. And so Embiid just easily goes through him all the way to the rim. You'll see that difference when they shrink the floor versus when they don't. It makes a big difference in how successful Embiid is. Here's an example of, uh, of how uh, Tyrese and Philly may look to attack Jalen Brunson. So as you can see, they tuck Jalen Brunson on Nick Batum. Again, that's the matchup I think they will go with if they end up uh, starting Batum or, cl or closing with him. They're going to hedge and recover here, but OG Ananobi is going to use a little kind of veteran trick to allow this play to work. So again, here's our hedge. Watch OG Ananobi's right arm. He's looped around and is basically hugging Batum. Why does that matter? Batum can't slip out of the hedge now because OG is holding him. So he holds him for a while. That way, when Brunson wants to recover, OG can recover, and now everything is back in order. And they force him into a tough pull-up jump shot that he misses. I think OG will get some minutes on uh, Tyrese Maxey as well. I just don't think necessarily that's the best use of him. 
Here's a much better example of the Knicks shrinking the floor on Joel Embiid. Here we go. We're going to get the same kind of thing. Hardenstein drive. Watch how much better they do kind of closing these gaps. Now Dante DiVincenzo digs in without being late. He digs early before Embiid gets ahead of steam and he's able to force a turnover. Here's an example of an action that the Sixers ran to get a really good look for Tyrese uh, Maxey. You guys will recognize this as stack, pick, and roll. So again, we got our ball screen. Here's the ball screen. OG chases over the top. Hartenstein's kind of in a bit of a high drop. And beads rolling. Um, Nick Batum is going to set a back screen on Isaiah Hartenstein. And there's a bunch of things that open up here. Actually, Jalen Brunson does a really nice job peeling off of Batum and getting a late contest, and he actually forces a miss. But they got a really good look out of that. But it doesn't matter, and this is the advantage of stack, pick, and roll. Look at what happens when Embiid gets behind Hartenstein. So Hartenstein gets back screened. And so Embiid now, even though Maxi misses this layup, Embiid is just in super, you know, he's just in commanding offensive rebound position. And Hartenstein's just not going to be able to do much when he's getting back screened like that to get back in front of Embiid and box him out. Here's an example of really good individual defense by Nick Batum on Jalen Brunson. Watch the screen navigation. Watch the late contest. Fighting over the top. And again, it's all about length. It's not even necessarily about getting caught on the screen a little bit. It's can you bother this shot from behind? And he can. He gets a really good contest. You can actually see Brunson flop as he tries to draw a foul on it. But he's making Brunson uncomfortable with back pressure there. That's a really good rep. All righty. This is a, a more individual defense from Isaiah Hartenstein on Joel Embiid. And more shrinking the floor. So again... As I talked about in the uh, in the early part of the video, it's all about Isaiah Hartenstein absorbing contact long enough for the other guys to come over. So Embiid's going to make it a, a really aggressive move here. As he does his rip through, watch Hartenstein absorb this blow, which stands Embiid up long enough for Julius Randle to come in from behind and get a block. Again, they can if they shrink the floor around him and you make Isaiah Hartenstein's job, like you don't have to even contest. You just need to absorb that contact long enough for us to get into the picture and make a play. Here is the exact same concept, but this time in transition. So Embiid's looking to push. Look at Hartenstein sprint back, even though he got hit in the face. Sprint back, absorb the contact, allow the help to come over. Again, if he can just slow him down enough if you can slow him down enough for the help to get into the picture, I think they're going to do a good enough job defensively on him. Here is an example of Deuce McBride playing some good individual defense on Tyrese Maxey. And then also a coverage thing that I wanted to talk about. If Tyrese Maxey's 10%, uh, makes 10% fewer of his pull-up jump shots and loses 40% of shot value, why not, considering, uh, why not consider ducking under some picks? So you're going to see the first one, Deuce McBride beats him to the spot. That's a, an athletic play that only Deuce McBride can make uh, on the Knicks uh, compared to some of these other guys. Again, look at that really quick step. He's just one of those guys that can actually match up quickness with Tyrese Maxey relatively well. Now, from here, uh, now I think he made this read because the ball screen was so high, but Deuce goes underneath this screen. I'm saying they should probably consider doing this even more often. But uh, here's an example of it pretty far away from the basket. Deuce goes way under. Actually, I mean, that screen's pretty low. It's possible that this is the game plan in this segment of the game. But I I'm con I would consider using this as part of their game plan to try to contain some of Tyrese's dribble penetration. He's going to step into a pull-up three, and he's going to miss it. Again, like a 40% dip in shot value for Maxi when he takes a dribble before he shoots. Uh, here's an example of when uh, Deuce McBride does chase over the top, and this is actually why I think it was kind of an impromptu move there from uh, from McBride. But we're going to get it back to Maxi. Deuce is going to chase, but because he chases, he's going to give up dribble penetration. And see, like, he doesn't really have much trouble turning the corner on Hartenstein. So again, that's an example of why I might consider going underneath picks. 
This Tyrese Maxey dribble penetration thing is the biggest thing that I uh, have fear for for New York. Here, OG and Anobi's on the ball. OG's so concerned about Tyrese getting to that strong hand and uh, potentially a brush screen from Ubre here that Maxi just goes to a basic crossover dribble and just toasts him off the dribble. So yeah, Maxi dribble penetration is going to be a huge, huge factor in this series. Embiid's ability to manage double teams is going to be a key element of this series. I'm going to show you guys an example of a bad post-up read from Joel Embiid. And this is the kind of thing that Embiid's just going to have to do better if Philly's going to win the series. So post-entry, over the top, we get baseline help. Now, you can't see in the picture, but Kelly Oubre is on this wing. And what we have here is we have our double team of Embiid. Josh Hart is basically our low man. He's in position to rotate to Tobias Harris. Quentin Grimes is fronting Nick Batum and not allowing this entry. Jalen Brunson is in position to guard Tyrese Maxey. The open man is Kelly Oubre on this left wing. And instead, for some reason, Joel Embiid just throws it right to Quentin Grimes. And Quentin Grimes gets it. So those are the kinds of reads that Embiid's just going to have to do a better job making. Here's one of the examples that I was talking to you guys about with Isaiah Hartenstein looking to score when Embiid's trolling the paint. So Embiid's just not worried about Hartenstein. He's calling for the ball. But Embiid's not worried about Hartenstein. Now watch, watch Embiid start trolling the off-ball actions. So good. Uh, Brunson looks to make a little back cut. Embiid slides over that way. Uh, OG Ananobi back cuts Kelly Oubre. Embiid slides over that way. So Embiid's just trolling the paint, ignoring Hartenstein. And Hartenstein just goes, fuck it, I'm going to drive. <laughs> and he gets into the lane and makes his little pop shot. So again, and he'll do that. He's been doing that all season long. Like you just got to be careful with Hartenstein with as Embiid. Like just make sure you keep an eye on him and and, and pay attention when he's uh, getting ready to load up for one of those drives. Here's an example of a coverage I expect to see from the Knicks throughout the series: is a strong side zone. So they run a ball screen. We get a little feed to Embiid. Now. Strong side zone here because Julius Randle's not guarding anybody. He's just stepping outside this block so he doesn't get a defensive three second. It's effectively a double team. We have really poor off ball spacing here. And Embiid's going to end up taking a little jab step jumper. And this is going to be one of the biggest shots of the series for him. If he shoots 50% on that shot, I think the Sixers are going to win. If he shoots 30% on that shot, I think the Sixers have a good chance of losing. Here's an action that I really want to see a lot from the Sixers in this series and an easy way to get the defense in rotation. So this is actually one of my primary concerns for the Knicks. I don't think the Knicks have an action they can go to that is as guaranteed to generate an advantage situation as this particular action is going to be. So we have OG Ananobi on Tyrese Maxey. We have Joel Embiid setting the screen. We have Hartenstein in a high drop. Embiid pops to the three-point line, and he catches there. Now, we know Embiid can shoot, but Embiid is looking to drive this closeout. This is what we call a baked-in driving lane, right? We talk about this all the time. When the off, when the offensive player is in a in a spot-up situation and the guy who's guarding him is helping on a, on a severely on one side of him, even if he throws a good closeout, there is a baked-in driving lane in the opposite direction from where he's closing out from. So we have our kick-out pass. Hartenstein is closing, but Embiid has a baked-in rip to the left, takes it, gets easily downhill, and finishes. So again, whether it's a catch-and-shoot three if he closes out short, whether it's an immediate help where Embiid has to make a read from there, at the very least, the Sixers can go to that and relatively consistently get the defense in rotation. The alternative there is, oh, we're just going to uh, we're gonna consider switching, right? So let, let's just have OG and Adobe guard Embiid, and we'll put... Hartenstein on Tyrese Maxey. Tyrese Maxey's just going to beat him off the dribble. We saw, we've seen that already in these pick and roll coverages, how easy he can turn the corner on Hartenstein. And so I think this is going to be a predicament for the Knicks, this basic little pick and pop action. Here's another example of individual defense by Nick Batum on Jalen Brunson. And it, th this was... This, to me, is is the direction I think the Sixers need to go. So we got some backcourt ball pressure. Brunson gets an angle on him, gets rid of the basketball. We're going to cut through here. Brunson, uh, Batum stays attached. We get screening action, screening action. He gets all the way around. 
gets back in front, gets crossed over, gets crossed over again, even though he gets beat a little bit, watch the backside length here. That's an extremely well-contested shot from Nick Batum. And Brunson was just on one this night, and he made it. And again, Brunson's a star. He's going to make these plays. I want you to watch this play without me stopping it from start to finish. Just look at the job that Nick Batum does, just being a pest, pressuring the ball, staying attached, navigating screens well. This is a beast of a screen from Julius Randle that he gets through. Like, look at how hard he gets hit, and he fights through that. Gets through Hartenstein, gets back in front, gets beat by another move and gets a great contest. I, I think he has the best combination of length and mobility to do this job. So I would go with Nick Batum. Here are the, uh, um, uh, here's what happens when the Knicks actually switch the pick and pop with Tyrese Maxey. Okay. So as you can see here, we're going to get um, the switch. But at the same time, because OG kind of like stayed attached before he switched, he gets a little bit late on the closeout and Embiid knocks down a three. But also, they could just as easily um, they could just as easily swing this back to Tyrese Maxey. He and he can attack uh, Hartenstein off the dribble. Last thing, this is the Knicks action that I think that they could go to to kind of get the defense and rotation as best as they can. This is going to be a two man game with Jalen Brunson and Dante Divincenzo. So here's our matchup. So we have Tyrese Maxey on Dante. We have. Um, uh, Kelly Oubre Jr. on Brunson. The first time they said it, it's just going to be a switch, but Jalen Brunson is just too good of a scorer to be guarded by the likes of Tyrese Max. He easily gets to his spot, knocks it down. So this next one, you'll see same exact thing, switch, but Batum comes with a double team. And Batum, by the way, good work on the double team of getting into the passing lane to make it a little bit more difficult. Now, Brunson just makes a bad read here. He's just got to find a way to get this over here. Just has to find a way. Instead, he ends up swinging it to the right wing. They find a little slot drive, but Embiid's at the rim. They draw a foul anyway. But that's just an example of, uh, of Philly switching that specific action. The other thing that they could consider doing, like I talked about earlier, is just to hedge and recover. So let's say that on this play, let's say that uh, Dante comes up. Tyrese can literally just step out and cut off the drive. And then as soon as he cuts off the drive, just close out. And then because he cuts off the drive, Brunson will have to come this way, which buys Batum a chance to recover and meet him over here somewhere. All righty. So yeah, um, again, don't feel super strongly about this one. This is the only series uh, that I've seen that has that has had me waffle back and forth this much. So Knicks fans, I don't want you to think that I don't think you have a chance to win this series. I certainly think you do. I think the Vegas line is a strong indicator of the fact that Vegas views this as a very close series as well. But to me, I just think there's a little bit more offensive firepower for Philly and a similar defensive ceiling. And so I'm going with the Sixers, but, but the basketball character gap between these two teams and the things that I like about the Knicks, I think are going to stretch this thing way out. So I'm picking the Sixers in seven. All right, let's get to our mailbag. And before we get to a mailbag question, I want to talk about Team USA for a minute. So we got the preliminary 12-man roster that got released, and I just kind of want to talk through it and give my initial opinions on the basketball dy dynamics at play with this team. So the 12 players at guard, they have five guards in the group, Steph Curry, Devin Booker, Drew Holiday, Anthony Edwards, Tyrese Halliburton. At forward, they have four forwards, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum, Kawhi Leonard. Those are the four legendary American forwards. It's going to be really cool watching them all play together. And then at the center position, Joel Embiid, Anthony Davis, and Bam Adebayo. So first thing that I want to get into is I would start Anthony Davis over Joel Embiid. I don't think he will. I think Embiid's cachet is going to lead to him starting, but I personally would start Joel Embiid. The highest value that can be brought at that position with this group of players is versatile defense and connectivity on offense. Embiid is a one-dimensional defender. He defends in drop coverage. He can protect the rim, but he's not good out on the perimeter, and he's not a great read and react player. He's not the kind of guy that's going to be able to play in a heavy ball and player movement type of offense. And Anthony Davis, you've watched him succeed as a connective piece in the Lakers five out equal opportunity offense. And he's very versatile defensively. He can defend in drop coverage and protect the rim. He can defend in high drop. He can blitz and he can switch. And again, and I want to try to explain this point by using the starters. So my 
what I would start with with this group is Steph Curry at the one, Jason Tatum at the two, Kevin Durant at the three, LeBron James at the four, Anthony Davis at the five. You would have all sorts of scheme versatility with that group. You could switch one through five. Even if Steph ended up in an unfavorable matchup, Steph could press up on the jumper or front the post in a in a post-up situation because literally on the back line, you have Kevin Durant, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and Jason Tatum. And a ton of length and athleticism that can cover ground in help. So I think you could do some switching there, or you can run drop and have Tatum run over the top. I think Tatum is a is a guy that can be very uh, impactful as a primary point of attack defender. It's it's something that I think has been an underrated trait of his over the course of his career and have that length chasing over the top to funnel into Anthony Davis in a drop coverage with Kevin Durant and LeBron James operating as the low man or the guy on the wing that rotates down. Like they're, they're I think you could do a lot defensively with that particular group. With Joel Embiid, I just don't think you're as versatile defensively. Now, Embiid has value here. Like uh, bigger European centers that can bury Anthony Davis under the rim. If you run into that kind of matchup, if you run into Jokic, Joel Embiid is one of the guys that actually has the physical size to kind of hang with Nikola Jokic. But in the aggregate, in most matchups, I like Anthony Davis there. And then on the offensive end of the floor, AD is just like, like AD and LeBron, think about the damage they do with the Lakers in all their horn sets and stuff as just operating at the elbow as screen and roll guys. Like, I, I now imagine instead of Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell, it's Kevin Durant and Steph Curry. That that's where I kind of see the 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 fluidity and connectivity of that five man group just working with more of like a five out big in Anthony Davis rather than this you know supremely gifted post up ISO player in Joel Embiid. I think there's value there, but I think he I, I think Anthony Davis makes more sense in the core groups. Uh, who all should play? I when I look at the roster, I think Drew Holiday has to play. I think Kawhi Leonard has to play. Again, Joel Embiid has to play, especially in specific matchups. I think that's your eight-man rotation. So Steph, Tatum, LeBron, KD, Anthony Davis, Drew Holiday, Kawhi Leonard, Joel Embiid. And then if you needed another perimeter defense option, if a, a super quick guard that's causing you problems and Tatum is struggling with screen navigation and uh, and Drew Holiday, for whatever reason, is not fast enough for the guy, I think Anthony Edwards is another guy who could get really handsy on the perimeter and contain a ball handler, so I think you could go to him as well. As far as my prediction goes for how that team will perform, if they embrace five out and they play for each other, I think they're going to wipe the floor with everyone. But if they kind of play your turn, my turn, and they don't embrace all the details and they play lazy basketball, the teams overseas are good enough to beat them. But that said, even though the top of the NBA is no longer American players, the depth of talent in the United States is still far greater than the rest of the league. And we're sending our best guys this time. And if they embrace playing for each other and doing the right things, I think they're going to win easily in the Olympics. All right, mail that question. Jokic is 19th in free throw attempts per game, but 10th in points in the paint. Of those ahead of him in, fr in free throws attempt, but behind in points in the paint are Anthony Edwards, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Damian Lillard, DeMar DeRozan, Zion Williamson, Paolo Boncaro, Jer Jaron Jackson Jr., and maybe more. I ran out of room before I was asked to pay. Plus, Jokic has as many or more games played than almost all these guys. Anyway, why do you think Jokic doesn't get the free throw attempts others do? And what do you think he could do different to get those free throw attempts? Love the show and watch nearly every episode. Keep it up. Thank you so much for the kind words and for supporting the show. So um, I can relate to this personally as someone who's rooted to LeBron, rooted for LeBron James. And I think LeBron generally through his career has not gotten very many foul calls, uh, especially over the course of this later stretch of his career. But like, I've never had a problem with it. And the main reason why is I want LeBron to be able to play bully ball. And in order for LeBron to be able to play bully ball, you got to have a give and a take there. And I don't think you have to look much further than the free throw attempt leaders to see that bully ball players don't really get rewarded. Now, Giannis is the exception. Giannis is number one in free throw attempts. He's the outlier. I think he gets an absurd whistle. I Every time I watch Giannis play, I watch him run dudes over and get foul calls, and I think it's completely ridiculous. I don't have an explanation for you. He's the outlier. But LeBron James and Nikola Jokic are both top 10 in points in the paint. 
but they both only shoot six free throws a game. And I'm okay with that because I want them to be able to physically inflict themselves on the opponent as well. But if you go down the rest of the free throw attempt list, it makes some sense. It's like number two is Shea Gilders Alexander. He's a finesse player who's a grifter. Number three is DeMar DeRozan. He's a finesse player who's a grifter. Number four is Luka Doncic. He plays some bully ball, but he gets his calls with finesse grifting, you know, low gathers, pump fakes, things along those lines, right? Uh, Anthony Davis is at six in free throw attempts. He flops a lot. Nicole Jokic doesn't. That's kind of in his personality, right? Number seven is Damian Lillard. He's a finesse grifter. So you get the point. Like free throw attempts are so not about uh, uh, necessarily about shooting in the paint. It's about grifting. The shooting in the paint is part of it. You want to shoot in the paint. The Lakers being a team that scores in the paint a lot is part of what pushes up their free throw attempts. But the real reason they shoot a ton of free throws is Austin Reeves is a grifter. Anthony Davis is a grifter. Two of their top four scorers are guys that specialize in finding ways to get to the foul line. So like at a certain point like that, that, that is kind of, it's only half the battle. Half the battle is getting in the paint often and getting into contact situations a lot. The other half of it is like, it's kind of a gamesmanship thing. And LeBron James and Nikola Jokic have never been good at that gamesmanship. I'm happy with that because I don't want to watch them do that. Like the, you see LeBron pump fake and, and draw a foul on a on a on Larry Nance because he leaves his shoes in the Pelicans game. That's pretty uncommon. That's not something that LeBron does often. The best foul grifters in the league, they do it three, four times every single game. Jason, you're the man. Is there any reason LeBron doesn't match up Hunt, KCP, and Murray? I think the Lakers are missing out on taking advantage of the strategy, especially for D'Lo to keep him engaged or ever run screen and rolls to keep Jokic involved. So I think this is one of the major kind of like swing factors of the series. Uh, I think that they absolutely need to keep their five starters on the floor as much as possible because in order to attack Contavious Caldwell Pope or Jamal Murray, mainly I'm looking at Jamal Murray there. I think Contavious Caldwell Pope's just a really good defender, and I think hunting him is a suicide mission to begin with. But with Jamal Murray, you have to have him guard a good offensive player, or he's just going to hedge and recover. And it's really that simple. Like you know, a lot of times where things fall apart for the Lakers against the Nuggets is when they can hide Jamal Murray on a Cam Reddish or last year a Dennis Schroeder. And then even if he hedges, the guy slips out of that screen. And even if he catches, Jamal can recover in time or they just don't have to worry about that guy knocking down the shot. If you make Jamal Murray guard Austin Reeves because KCP has to guard D'Lo, because Aaron Gordon has to guard LeBron because Michael Porter Jr. has to guard Rui Hachimura. Then in that situation, if they don't switch and they hedge, Austin Reeves is a very good movement shooter and he can pop to the foul, the free throw line or, or slip to the free throw line or pop to the three point line and make shots and attack closeouts and things along those lines. Like again, attacking a matchup is not as easy as like, just call for a screen, get a switch and go. Most coach, you don't think Mike Malone sitting around going like, how do we make sure Jamal Murray does not get attacked in this series? And the way they're going to do that in most cases is going to be hiding him on the worst offensive player every single opportunity they get. And when he has to guard a good offensive player, they're going to have him hedge and recover. And so again, and again, that hedge and recover for those of you guys who don't understand the, the concept, it's just when the screen gets set, you jump out high to cut off the driving lane and then you sprint back to the screener as soon as you can. Hi, Jason. I think the Lakers should put Austin on Michael Porter Jr. and put LeBron on Jamal Murray for defense. I think Austin is fast enough to keep his body on MPJ and LeBron can bully Jamal. Maybe not for the whole series, but just if Jamal starts cooking, what do you think? So uh, Austin on MPJ is a little bit of an issue because MPJ can just shoot over him easily. That was an issue early in the series last year. Austin actually started with the Michael Porter Jr. assignment and just got shot over and rebounded over a lot. It's just too much of a size disadvantage. Now, I do think you can consider going to that look if you run into the situation where it's a late game situation, you just need a few stops. And then you do what you did in 2020. You put LeBron James on Jamal Murray, Anthony Davis on Nicole Jokic, switch any sort of two-man game that they run. I'd put D'Lo on Michael Porter Jr. and I'd put Austin on KCP because KCP is just more active running off of, uh, 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 just with speed running off of screens. And I think Austin's a little bit more diligent staying attached. Michael Porter Jr. spots up more, even though Michael Porter Jr. also runs off screens. Everybody runs off screens. But KCP does so more. So I would put Austin there and I put D'Lo on Michael Porter Jr. But I do think they'll go to that look. 
I just don't think it's something you can ask LeBron to do for an entire series. I think it's more of a crunch time thing. And one of the major points of this series that I'm looking at here is like, how much of the dirty work are LeBron and AD willing to do? Are you going to let Rui just get flambeed on an island? Or are you going to step in there and try to help him? Because like, I hate to break it to you, but if you go down with Rui guarding Jokic, you're just going to lose the series. And you might lose the series anyway. But I think your best bet is to ask your two best defensive players, LeBron James and Anthony Davis, to try to close that deal. Last question. Jason, your logic is correct, but I'm not there that Steph has declined because of age. It's more to do with lack of support. LeBron is a top 10 to 12 player with a top 10 supporting cast that is a championship ceiling. By that logic, Steph, who is ranked higher than LeBron, needs similar support than you can have that ceiling. First of all, I don't think Steph's better than LeBron anymore. I think LeBron has clearly played better basketball than him this season, especially down the stretch of the season. I do think sporting ca supporting cast plays a role. There's no doubt that Steph has a really tough job. but I watched Steph in 2021 without Klay Thompson with a substantially more limited offensive roster be at a much, much higher level as a player. Go back and watch some of those games from the springtime in 2021, the year they lost in the play-in. Go back and watch some of those games. They would have made the playoffs straight up if it wasn't for Steph like bruising his tailbone on the, on the stair step. He was cooking the entire league in that series or in that season in the springtime, similarly limited supporting cast. I'd argue this year's supporting cast is better than the supporting cast he had in 2021. Steph found a way to keep the team afloat with his high level play anyway. There's this guy right now in 2024 is not the same guy that Steph was in 2021. That's why I think it's a decline. There's no doubt that there's been some supporting cast related issues that have made things tougher on Steph. But the bottom line is for a significant chunk of the tail end of the season, Steph was a low 20 point per game guy that was inefficient by his standards. That's not what he was regardless of sporting cast in the previous three seasons. That's why I thought it was concerning. And to that point, LeBron last year, because he couldn't shoot, because he wasn't as mobile, obviously he was injured as well. He wasn't playing as well, even though he had a similar level supporting cast. LeBron has gotten better. That's why he looks better this year. I don't think it's over for Steph. I think it's possible that he polishes some things up and does some stuff with his body to regain some quickness and regain some of that Steph, uh, Steph kind of flair next year. But th that was an extended stretch of Steph just playing at a hefty tier below. Like I'll just put it simply. Steph wasn't even playing at a top 10 level for the last third of the season. That was a major, major concern for me. And again, like I said, just compare it to that 2021 season and how well he was playing with a limited supporting cast. That's where I get, uh, get concerned. And that's why I said on the show the other day, I think the championship ceiling is over. If Steph can't recapture legitimate top five Steph, it doesn't matter if you bring in a secondary star, you're still just not going to be as good as the other teams in the Western Conference. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. We will be back on Saturday morning with a couple of really quick previews of the 1-8 matchups. And then later that night, live on YouTube after the final buzzer of game one of Nuggets Lakers, I will see you guys then.